Welcome to Beyond the Red Carpet. Today, I have a very fun and special guest, Mr. Paul Peterson. Welcome, Paul. Well, thank you, Francine. A pleasure to be here. Now, Paul, you are one of the original teen heartthrobs. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well before David Cassidy and all that. Okay, let, let's start from the beginning and move up to what you're doing now. Okay. Uh, at age 12, you joined, you started on the Donna Reed show. Right, that was age 12, but I had been busy before that. Yes, I, that, I was, really, that really cemented you in the minds of the public, I believe. I think so, in terms of television, yes. But I had already uh, done a big film with Cary Grant and Sophia Loren called Houseboat. Yes. And yay, there you are. Which was a wonderful um, uh, A-grade movie with genuine... Hollywood stars and, and uh, very expensive production values. But the Donna Reed show definitely put us into people's homes right. every Thursday night. That lasted from 1958 to 1966. So you Correct. grew up, you were one of the original people that grew up on camera. Literally. And, yeah, literally. But, but before we get into that, let's go back to this. Because when I interviewed you before, um, my heartthrob has always been Cary Grant, obviously. Right, right. You told me, I told you that my favorite scene was in the back of the boat, the houseboat, where you were sitting alone with Cary Grant. Yes. You right. told me something about that scene that he, he told you. Do you remember that? Well, he told me many things. Uh, I, I probably you're referring to him saying to make it believable that this was a very important scene between my character and, and his dad. And if you remember, it was how, how life is a cycle and it continues. That right, even right. when we had water in the pitcher and poured it out, it didn't disappear, it just changed its, its form. And he, he told you, what you told me before is he told you this was your scene. He was a very oh. generous actor. And he said, this is all your scene. Is that well, right? And, and yes, that's absolutely true. And if you think about it, Cary Grant many times played the straight man. He was the guy that uh, passed out the, the dialogue that let the funny people do their thing. Uh, Arsenic and Old Lace is a classic example of that, uh, where it was all the characters spinning around him that had their moments in the sun. And Cary Grant was kind of every man in the middle of a madhouse. But he understood that he was wonderful to work with yes. because he was, he was in earnest. He looked you right in the eye and listened. It was uh, quite an experience. I'm jealous that you got that close to him. But let's move on to the uh, the role of Jeff Stone that made you a, a household figure. Mm -hmm. And you worked with Donna Reed and Carl Betts. And uh, they basically gave you your acting um, chops at the time. Oh, I think that's true. You know, uh, Donna Reed, of course, was a big star in our uh, Iowa household because she was born in the county right next door to my mom's county in uh, Cherokee, Iowa. Donna was in Crawford. And uh, Carl Betts was a Shakespearean trained actor who won the Carnegie Award uh, back in his college days from Carnegie Mellon. So he knew his stuff. And of course, Donna had already won the Academy Award. Uh, uh, okay, so Shelley Fabre was played your sister but you were friends long after that too as well we'll get yes. into that but um what is it like for and I, now i know we're the minor consideration is coming up too but what is it like going to work when you were just a little kid knowing that everybody's watching you and do you have any qualms about growing up in front of the camera or were, did they make everything easy for you? Well, I, it's a, being, a, being a celebrity at a young age is a challenge. And if you don't have grounded people around you, particularly your parents, 
but just as important your adult co-workers, uh, you're at risk because it's a fantasy world. Uh, it's not a normal thing for people to wait on a 12 year old hand and foot to make excuses for you or give you special access. Uh, even the education is unusual. You know, I, I spent eight years on the Donna Reed show, never saw the inside of a classroom because I had my own tutor paid for by the studio and, and the show. And uh, Dr. Barkley, my, uh, my tutor, was a remarkable woman who had raised previous generations of kid stars. So she knew how to cope. And she did a heck of a job, I think. Uh, Shelly and I both adored her. So uh, you, there, there were laws back then that you had so many hours on set and so many hours in the classroom? Yes, that's correct. The, the rules in California, now let me remind everybody, California has pretty good laws for working children. But many states have no laws, uh, North Carolina most uh, prominently. Uh, so in California, you had an eight or eight and a half hour day, uh, three hours of which had to be spent in school on a school day. Uh, and it, it didn't have to be consecutive hours. It could be broken up into 15 or 20 minute segments. And that was carefully uh, uh, checked by your studio teacher. And a studio teacher is a, is a full-fledged uh, uh, theatrical union, part of IATSE. Here's the problem, Francine. Children in the entertainment business on a federal level are exempt from federal child labor laws. Mm -hmm. That means that if a state doesn't have laws on the books, children are at risk. It also means that if a state chooses to look the other way or not patrol the workplace, children are at risk. For example, the state of uh, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania with John and Kate plus eight. Here they had the number one show on cable television, John and Kate plus eight. Mom was paid, dad was paid, directors were paid, writers were paid, and those eight children were not paid. And no representative from the Department of Labor and Industry in Pennsylvania in a six year run ever came to the working set where those children were employed. We had to go to Pennsylvania to get them to look at their own child labor laws and follow them. Okay, you know, a, a minor consideration is an amazing organization which you started. Can you tell me how and why and when you, you decided to go in that direction for child actors? Let me, before, it, it, it is, is the representative for the emotional, the financial, legal, and um, protection of child actors, but, and th that's all your baby. So can, well, let's, let's talk about that. Okay, I, I will. Uh, first understand that um, back in the 70s, my 10th book was called Walt, Mickey and Me, which recounted my experiences as an original Mouseketeer back in 1955. And from that time, I was friends with and, and, and close friends with a whole group of, of kid stars, working kid actors. We'd meet in auditions and, and we'd meet for social gatherings. Our parents were friends. And uh, when I wrote Walt, Mickey and Me, I became aware, this is in 1956, 50, or 76, 77, of certain common threads in our mutual experiences. And some of those threads were really quite harmful because there was not enough supervision of the parents. Uh, no one had addressed the law, which even in California stated quite bluntly that parents own their children, their income and services. That's family law 
in the United States. So here he had a working kid who did not own the money they, they uh, earned. The Coogan Law, which people across the world believed protected kid actors, uh, only came into effect in 1938. So left a lot of kids out of the picture. Shirley Temple, and Rooney, uh, uh, Diana Sarah Carey, Jackie Coogan himself, because you had to have a long running contract on a specific uh, a show or at a studio. So the kids like say me and Shelley on the Donna Reed show, we had long-term contracts. So a portion of our money was set aside, but all the kid stars who came and worked on the Donna Reed show, they were completely free of anything called Coogan. There was no mandatory set aside. There was no uh, oversight in the way their money is spent. And that's why even up through the days of, of Gary Coleman, there could be such incredible financial abuse. Well, a whole bunch of former kid stars got together at SAG and AFTRA and put together a legislative proposal, proposal, at least in California, which covered all children in the workplace. That it was their money and a portion of that money would be saved in what we call a coupon account. Unfortunately, that is not yet national. We still have about 15 or 16 states who have not yet adopted the California model, which is a pretty good model. Interestingly, Francine, and I tell this to people and they end up shaking their head. We have more rules in America for the protection of animals in show business than for children. And if you doubt me, just look at the end of a movie. You'll see the words right there on the screen. No animal was killed or injured in the making of this film. Why doesn't it say that for children? Yeah, Why? good point. Good point. Um, okay, so. I was trying to tell you how I got to a minor consideration. Right, right, right. I'm, I, that, that, that just, that's just mind boggling to, to think about that. But okay, so. so now we're going so, I, to so let me jump ahead. The book came out in 1977. And in 1990, a very good friend of mine, I grew up with him, he's a little bit younger than I. Uh, we raced cars together, chased girls, all that stuff that teenage boys do. His name was Rusty Hamer. And Rusty was 12 years on the Danny Thomas show, gifted actor. Oh, what a wickedly funny kid he was. And he had no career after Danny Thomas. And he became embittered and overweight. He uh, burned bridges, moved from place to place. And even with the loving support of his older brother, John, he lost his way and he ended up killing himself in January of 1990. And when the news came across uh, CBS radio, I was in bed on a Sunday morning and I said to my wife, that will never happen again. It had happened too many times. If there's a kid actor in trouble, I promise her and myself, I'm gonna show up. And uh, knocking on wood as I speak to you, that's what we do. If there's a kid actor in trouble, if there's trouble on the set, if mom and dad are, are wantonly exploiting their child, we're going to show up. And the interesting thing about former kid stars, we have earned access to the media. We have a place, a respected place within the theatrical unions. So people listen to our voice. So when we see studio teachers who are not up to snuff, who are missing whole segments of, of educational necessities, we're able to go talk to people. We're able to go into union meetings and say, now listen, you've got a kid who's 12 years old and can't read, can't read, but he's a star in a television show. We gotta fix that. 
And people started to listen to us after Rusty's death. Uh, really important people on either side of the camera. And slowly but surely, we began to create a larger sphere of influence. We began, uh, this is particularly important to me this week after the birth of a new niece at two pounds, 12 ounces. Hollywood was hiring premature babies, usually twins or triplets, grievously underweight, at risk for ill-formed lungs and heart, vision, and they were doing it routinely. And when we caught the industry doing this, we made a big public statement about this. And the New York Times carried, the Washington Post carried the story, the trade papers began to carry it. And in the span of 90 days, we wrote and passed what we call the preemie bill, which prohibited employers in the entertainment business from hiring a baby who was not even full term. So we had to, we had to do that in law to stop Hollywood from doing it. Anyway, that was the beginning of our legislative success and things grew from there. Uh, you are a hero to child actors and children everywhere. Um, but let me ask you another thing. Um, we spoke about this a long time ago. Why is it that so many child actors have so much problems uh, later on in life, like the, the drugs or the suicides? That That is just, you, you, you go online, you see a long list of, of children. Um, the, the, uh, what's her name um, from Buffy from um, Family Affair? Yeah, that, that's... <laughs> That's how unusual the life is. Uh, it is the world upside down. In ordinary growth and development, the circle of influence of a, a, a growing child as you move through adolescence increases. You get more influence, you learn more, you are wiser. You make fewer mistakes, hopefully. But in the entertainment industry, particularly if the job that made you famous, famous comes to an end, you're at risk. You may have already sacrificed meaningful relationships with your contemporaries. You may have had a poisoned relationship with your brothers and sisters and your parents. You may in fact have no more income when you've been the sole means of support. That's the stuff that happens. And it's all carried out very publicly. All of this stuff is the tabloids think it's their right to cover children as if they are uh, grown up performers who chose that life. And in the case of, of um, Dana Plato or Buffy from Family Affair, it can be a tragedy. And those, those are the people that a minor consideration deals with all the time. Now I should quickly point out, about a third of our thousand members, a thousand, are perfectly fine. They have gone through this process, fame, losing it, finding an adult career, and have done so with very few troubles. Another third of our membership has suffered terribly, but have overcome the troubles. And they're standing on their own, they're productive. It's that middle third, though, for whom these troubles are so compelling and so destructive that they end up taking their life. They end up being in prison. Sometimes it isn't just the former child star who's at risk, but their brothers and sisters. I have to tell you, Francine, I know more brothers and sisters of famous kids who committed suicide than famous kid actors who committed suicide. Is that mainly because they didn't get the, get the attention? For a million different reasons. Uh, it can be economic exploitation. It can be psychological harm. 
it can be that no matter what you do, you are compared to the more famous brother or sister. Let me tell you what my dad said to me one day. He said, Paul, I loved it when I could introduce you as my son, but I hated it when I was introduced as your father. That's the difference. Now, speaking of siblings, your sister did come onto the Donna Reed show. Boy, did she ever. I, I, I enjoyed watching her. I mean, I, I told you once, I said, I wanted to be Patty Peterson. She <laughs> Oh, Patty was adorable. Um, she held their, our producer, Tony Owen, who was Donna Reed's uh, husband, to a promise he made to her. He had promised her as he watched her grow up that she'd get a chance to be an actress uh, on the show. Well, wouldn't you know it, at the end of the fifth year, up came a script called The Orphan, in which the Stone family finds this little girl in a park across the street. Now, only show business does this. They hired Patty to play the part. Eddie Foy was the casting director, and he said she was wonderful. Well, she came on the set for that week, and she was, in fact, wonderful. We had a great time. And she did such a good job that they invited her back. So for the next three years, I had my baby sister on my side for the next three years of the show. Well, I ask this of, of um, spouses when I see them playing together. But let me ask you, as, a, as an older brother, were you more protective? Did you feel more at ease having your sister around? How, how was that psychologically being on set with her? Well, I, I was very much her protector, her guardian in law, not just because I was her big brother. Um, it was my job. And I, I was compelled to be sensible, to be, to be there for her. My job was easy, honest to goodness. Uh, um, acting on the Donna Reed show was, was simple for me. Watching out after my sister and the potential pitfalls and quicksand was a task, which I took seriously. And given that I was, you know, a genuine bubblegum star on the outside, uh, chasing girls and fast cars and all the rest, it grounded me. I had to be home by 10 o'clock because I had my baby sister to get up in the morning and get her ready and drive her to work. She was my ward. And uh, I took that seriously. And of course, it was fun. Honest engine. I'm talking. Um, she did not choose to do any more uh, acting after that, right? No, not and and mind you, this is a, a very talented uh, young woman. Yes, she was. Who could sing and dance, and she wanted nothing to do with it because she saw through the eyes of her older brother the damage that was done. She recognized the terrible emotional upset and distress within our family, divorce and, and economic exploitation and, and uh, the uh, dwindling of emotional strength. She saw all that and she wanted none of it. She married her high school sweetheart and had a regular life and which she continues to this day. <laughs> okay, now, besides acting, you yes. did you singing. <laughs> a singing career. Um, I, I, I've been looking up, well, I know you sing, but I've, I've been looking up some old uh, YouTube videos of you singing and everything. But this, the, James Darren, Jimmy Darren, Shelly Fabre, and Paul Peterson, you guys got together and did a couple um, how, how, did they, how did they bring you together? Is it like the monkeys, you know, let's just take this, this, and this and put them together? Or were you all friends and how did that work? Well, we all worked for Columbia Pictures and Columbia Pictures owned a record company called Cold Gems. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy Darren had already had a big hit, Goodbye Cruel World. 
Kelly Fabre had a monster hit called Johnny Angel. And I had a couple of hits too, because we were all in the, in the, in Ricky Nelson mold. You know, if you're a, a, an adolescent on a successful family show, you had a record career. And I wasn't alone on that. You know, Johnny Crawford had a singing career. Anyway, the, um, uh, Stu Phillips was our producer, a, a ranger, got the three of us together, Jimmy, Darren, Shelley Fabre, and me. We did a cast album for uh, Bye Bye Birdie because Columbia Pictures owned the score. We had a ball doing it. The uh, Teenage Triangle albums sold very well. And it was uh, both a friendship and a business uh, relationship that was really, um, has stood the test of time. It's great fun. I'm always in contact with Jimmy and with Shelly, of course. So you're still, you're still um, in contact with them. Do you ever see them or do you just talk I, to them all the time? Oh, absolutely. Shelly, I see her. She's like a sister. I mean, they're truly, well, I mean, I have two blood sisters and, and then I have Shelly, number three. And Jimmy Darren and I talk all the time. I'm sure you've heard his, uh, his commercials for a society of singers. He's an immensely talented man out of Philadelphia with a wonderful uh, a crooner's voice and a uh, good steady marriage and great sons. Uh, we've been friends for um, 60 years. Wow, that's great, that's great. Well, one more question before we leave. Um, yes. Was it your idea originally to become an actor or did your parents say, hey, do you want to try, try this? Or how did, how did that come to be? Well, it was pretty straightforward. Um, my mom believed in improving on the gifts that God gave you. And what that meant for me and my sisters was lessons, lessons, lessons. So before I was eight, I was singing in church. I was dancing at the... Uh, local uh, veterans uh, 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 auditorium. Uh, people seem to like my gifts, if you will. And I got started in show business because my mom was bigger than me. <laughs> okay. That, that simple. And one day my uh, teacher, Sally Sargent, heard about this thing called an open audition. This is in 1955 at Disney. And I, along with 2,500 other young boys who could sing and dance, uh, auditioned at Disney. And from that group of 2,500 boys and 2,500 girls, they hired 16 kids. I was one of them. Uh, I really could sing and dance. And people seemed to like it. And once I had gotten an agent through that process, uh, even though I after weeks, conduct them becoming a mouse. <laughs> By the time I got an agent, then I was going on auditions. And Francine, I'll tell you seriously, I'm a competitive guy. I wanted the job every time I auditioned. And the jobs got bigger and bigger and bigger. Lux Video Theater, Playhouse 90, movies like Houseboat. And then a television series that uh, Tony Dow says, I got the job and poof, there went my life. Wow. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. And for anybody interested in, um, in your legacy, I would suggest they go to a minor consideration. Is it dot .org or dot .org? .org, dot .org. We are a 501c3. And these days, probably the easiest access both for a minor consideration and for me personally, is on Facebook. We are we are well represented there. I'm easy to find. That's great. That's great. And I know people will start uh, once they see this. They'll they'll want to check into it because it is a fabulous organization. And you are true. I I, I really like calling you a friend. <laughs> uh, thank you, Francine. Very much appreciated. And I will see you next time on Beyond the Red Carpet. Thanks.